bonjour. Il nous fait plaisir de vous présenter Dr. Jürgen de Wispeler, un ergothérapeute qui est devenu philosophe. Il détient des diplômes en ergothérapie, en sciences morales et en politique sociale. Il est présentement stagiaire postdoctoral à l'Institute for Health and Social Policy et à la Faculté de droit de l'Université McGill, où il enseigne également au département de philosophie. Avant son arrivée à Montréal, il a enseigné à Barcelone, à Dublin et à Londres. Ses principaux intérêts de recherche concernent les aspects philosophiques des politiques sociales et institutionnelles, particulièrement leur application aux programmes d'aide sociale, aux politiques relatives aux personnes handicapées, à la santé et à la santé publique. He is currently working on the philosophical grounding of disability rights in a theory of freedom from domination. Dr. de Vispelare, van hartelijk welkom. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction first, and that, that was even a couple of words of uh, Flemish, so uh, much, much appreciated. So I, I, I am from Belgium, but pas uh, <laughs> Um So uh, first of all, I mean, I, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this, so I hope you had a very exciting morning. and. Uh, I mean, this, this is really looks like a marvelous event, and so I also look forward to hearing uh, my co-panelists speak later. So thanks very much to Debbie and Maud and everyone who's been involved in this for allowing me to participate. Um, I wanted to say two things very quickly. I just returned from Europe. I'm extremely jet-lagged. So <laughs> if at some point during the conference I stop talking or I make no sense whatsoever, please wave <laughs> and try and you know, kind of pick it up again. Uh, secondly, so it's true, I used to be an occupational therapist in a past life, but it's a long time ago. So if I say things that make no sense to the OT, you have to kind of keep that in mind. I haven't really had much connection with the clinical experience for a while, so I'm here to learn as much as to teach you a little bit, or not teach you, say a little bit about philosophy, okay? So uh, I know when, when we say philosophy, people usually panic. <laughs> I often have these sort of, you know, big eyes in the room. Um, I, I, I will try to do my best to make this a light sort of digestif after, uh, you know, after the lunch. So we're not going to make it too complicated. And, and I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, okay, without further ado, let's see where we start. So in a very basic sense, when we talk about justice, and so, so the whole point is about justice and disability, right? So when we talk about justice, we have two big questions. How can we live our lives together, given that we all have very different <coughs> needs and interests and abilities and so on and so forth, and we live in a world in which we have to work together, okay? Every, pretty much everything I do will have some impact on some other people, and that applies to everyone. So there's the big question, the big moral question about how can we live our lives together. And the second question then is, what do we owe to each other? And this is very much the question of justice, okay? Given that we live in a world which has scarce resources, we can't just give everyone everything they want and everything they need, so we're going to have to make hard choices, and we have to make these hard choices together. And for that, we invent theories of justice. You know, different theories will try and prioritize different sorts of values and try and come up with some account of how we should organize our society in a way that makes sense, makes sense ethically. And then, of course, with respect to disability, the question is, how do we do this? How can we take into account the very particular needs, interests, wants, and abilities of disabled people, given the fact that, you know, they, like us, are just citizens of a world in which we cooperate and live together and so on and so forth, okay? And one of the very unfortunate things when it comes to disabilities and theories of justice is that disability basically has been ignored more or less, until quite recently. So now there's actually quite a lot of interesting work being done on disability, but in many ways we're really just starting this agenda. So philosophers have totally lagged behind when it comes to these sort of things, okay? So let's see where we start. So I introduce you to John Rawls. John Rawls is El Padrino, is the godfather of uh, political philosophy. So he's, he's obviously passed away. But in, in 1970, he wrote a book, A Theory of Justice, and we're still using this as the key text. So many of us philosophers, political philosophers, working 
today we're either developing his theory, trying to apply it in different areas, criticizing it, or finding defenses, and so on and so forth. So he's very much still around. So I wanted to sort of say a few minutes something about his theory, and especially with respect to disability, as a starting point to get us into broader discussion. So I actually really like this picture, by the way. It looks sort of suitably, you know, a bit of, sort of Al Pacino, you know? <laughs> so Rawls basically wrote this, you know, five to six hundred pages, huge book, big architectural kind of book, cathedral of a book, really, with many, many, many original ideas. So I just want to kind of run you to, to the original position and the field of ignorance. And it's actually, you know, I mean, it's very complicated in one way, but it's very simple in another way. So Rawls's key issue was, how can we find principles of justice that appeal to everyone, that, take, that sort of give respect to everyone, given the fact that all of us have, as I said before, different interests, different needs, different abilities, and so on and so forth. So he came up with the following idea. We should find our principles of justice in starting off from something that he calls the original position. And in the original position, we have representatives of the different social positions, you know, people of the one percenters, people of the worst off in society, different genders, different, any sort of group, any social group you can imagine. They're all supposed to be represented, okay? And then we're going to put these people in a situation of fundamental equality and they deliberate, they rationally deliberate amongst each other, and then they come to a set of principles that's supposed to apply to everyone. Now, if you just put people in a situation like that, it's never going to work. Okay? We know this, you just have to look at the news and politics today. You put actual people in a situation in a room, there's still going to be disagreement and differences and so on and so forth. But Rawls then had a very interesting idea. He said, imagine that we have a veil of ignorance, a veil that comes down, and as it comes down, we lose part of relevant information. We lose our identity. So we lose the fact that ties us to a particular social position. We still know what goes on in the world. We still know that people will have conflict. We still know that there will be competition over scarce resources, that people will have different beliefs and different values. We know that, for example, you know, we might have some solidarity, but we also favor you know, taking care of our family and so on and so forth. But we don't know anymore which position we take up. Okay? So imagine something like, you know, this room, imagine a musical chair kind of event. Imagine that each of you occupies a social position, you're a social representative. We let the music play, you all move around, okay, and you take up different positions. And then at some point, the music stops. And whatever position you're in, that's where you're stuck. If, you know, imagine this is the 1% position, you're very well off, great, congratulations. On the other side, there might be people who will be struggling for the rest of their lives, okay? But again, you know, taking it, if you know this in advance, imagine you know this in advance, you have to deliberate about the rules, you know that the music will play, and you don't know when the music will stop. How would you do this? Okay? So Rawls's idea basically was that in this sort of context, people will have sort of rules that apply to everyone and specifically apply to the worst of position. Because it's great to be a one percenter, but if you don't know whether you're going to be the one percenter, you want to make sure that the worst of position is the best possible. You want to take care of the people who are the least advantaged in society. That was his general idea. Very, in one sense, very simple and very plausible. Okay? And of course, has led to 50 years of debate, mostly because you know, philosophers like me, we have to also earn our money, so we keep debating. Yeah. <laughs> this is why, incidentally, this is why philosophers never have solutions. We only have questions. It's an employment program. Okay? Um, so, what do we think about this in terms of disability? Well, so here is the problem. If you read this text, so this is John Rawls himself. I have assumed throughout, and shall continue to assume, that while citizens do not have equal capacities, they have, at least to the essential minimum degree, the moral, intellectual, and physical capacities that enable them to be fully cooperating members of society over a complete life. Okay? You see where the problem is? Imagine musical chairs, but no representative for the disabled. What do you think is going to happen? Okay? 
So how much chances do we think we're going to have policies that will, you know, appropriately reflect what disabled citizens themselves would want if there's no one here who actually fully represents this position? So the problem with Rawls is that he basically assumed, first we have a theory for normal people, and then we deal with the difficult cases. And unfortunately, disability was considered to be a difficult case. Okay? And to me, this is the big problem, and not just to me, to me and a whole bunch of other people, is that, you know, it's very, very hard to have a theory like this and start smuggling in some of these supposedly difficult cases, because the very starting point is problematic. Okay? So Houston, we have a big problem, and therefore we need to look elsewhere. Okay? So, you know, with all due respect to John Rawls, we'll move on and see whether we can do something else. Before I go into what I think is an alternative approach to Republican theory, and I should have said this from the beginning, anyone who thinks that Republicanism has something to do with our nice friends south of the border, it, no, okay? Nothing whatsoever, so you can relax and enjoy. I am not a Republican from the United States, it's nothing to do with that. Republicanism goes back to ancient Rome, so, you know, the terminology predates and has nothing, nothing to do whatsoever with that particular, I was going to say bunch, but <laughs> can I say bunch in this room? <laughs> so let, let's just think about a few points before we get to republicanism. So in many ways from Rawls's, from this little analysis of Rawls, we can actually come up already with two requirements. So, so think of the moment like what would a theory of justice apply to disability? What would it have to do? And I think there's two requirements. The first one I call the requirement of sufficient support. Which basically is, you know, at the end of the day, we know that we want to have a theory which ensures that these people can have whatever they need to lead a flourishing life. You know, which in some sense seems a fairly straightforward requirement. But then there's also the second one, which is a requirement of equal status. Okay? So provision of support must not build on assumptions that imply that disabled persons, people with disability, are somehow of lesser value, which is incompatible with dignity of self-respect. And again, we will think that this makes a lot of sense, okay? Although, when you mention this to people who have no experience at all with disability, I mean, you know, that kind of still looks like a little bit of an alien thing, okay? So it's worthwhile really stipulating this. Two key requirements, in my view, equally important. So here's the problem. You know, when you start combining them, lots of stuff goes wrong, okay? So there's a practical challenge. In practice, we often find today policies that will provide people with support by actually eating into the equal status component. And one of the best examples is, I mean, as, um, sorry, I forgot your name now, who did a kind introduction. So what's your name again? Marie-Hélène. Yeah. Marie-Hélène. Marie as Marie-Hélène said, I, I did some work on, on welfare state and welfare reform. You look into this area, it's absolutely atrocious, the sort of things people have to go through. The sort of, you know, the sort of really in, sort of invasive kind of, uh, you know, interferences that people have to go through in order to get literally crumbs of social security and social welfare and so on, okay? This is totally incompatible with anything to do with dignity, self-respect, equal status. So if you, if you're getting the adequate support depends on having to go through that process, there's something wrong practically. There's also a fundamental challenge for people thinking about philosophy, theories of justice and disability. And the problem here is, and this was very much exemplified by Rawls, the problem here is that we need to find a theory which can place disabled people at the center of the theory together with everyone else, while also accommodating very important issues about difference, right? So how do we do that? This is, the, this is really the big challenge. Okay? One of the biggest problems is that, as with Rawls, and at the moment we just have too many theories that say, let's first start with the normal cases, and then we add in the sort of complications. And it just didn't work. It doesn't work. And I was thinking about the following. It's kind of a silly example, but philosophers are entitled to use silly examples. <laughs> Imagine that someone tells you and says, look, you know, I'm going to give you a kitten. And you know you need to organize your house and make sure that you have everything because the kitten will arrive tomorrow. And you know the kitten, so you go to the shop and you say, what do I need for a kitten? I need a litter box, I need some litter, I need a little bowl, I need a cat flap for the door. Great. 
Turns out the kitten is a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just not going to work, right? Now, it's a silly example, but, but it's, this is the case. I mean, you know, you need to be sure that when it comes to these sort of issues, you have to put things at the center right away. Adding on different sort of theories just usually brings you in a huge amount of trouble. So, with these challenges and requirements in place, let's look whether we can find an alternative theory. So this is Philip Pettit. Philip Pettit actually still is alive. That's why he gets a color photo. Um, <laughs> so he's at the moment, he's an Irish philosopher. It's actually not, I just couldn't find a black and white one. He's at the moment a professor at Princeton, and he is basically one of the really leading thinkers of Republican freedom. So I thought he deserved to put his picture up there. So, so the question is, can we use freedom, a particular notion of freedom, as an alternative basis for determining people's claims of justice? And then very specifically for determining how we relate to the claims from justice from people with a disability. Okay? So, what is Republican freedom? In a nutshell, Republican freedom is freedom from arbitrary interference or freedom as non-domination. And let me explain a few things. So what I'm going to do is in a couple of slides, I'll explain you the sort of the very key idea of the theory. And again, huge debates about this, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, people have been working on this for the last 15 years as well. And then what I'd like to do is look at a couple of sort of applications insofar as I get there. What's my time, actually? So am I doing okay for time? You're doing okay. Good. I'm not going too fast, I hope. Okay, good. So, so Three points about Republican freedom. So the first point is freedom is relational. So here is two very, very different ways of thinking about freedom. We can think about freedom as, in many ways, having as many possible options, being able to do as many different separate things, okay? From, you know, whatever, like I get up in the morning, I want to walk out of my house, I want to feed my cat, I want to take a shower, you know, all of these are sort of options in themselves, okay? And then we can think about freedom in a very, very different way, namely freedom as somehow being hindered by other people. And Republicans basically think it's the second one that is relevant. The first one, of course, is something that we all value. But in many ways, this has to do with capacities and abilities. And they're very important, but they don't have anything to do with freedom. Okay? And in order to have freedom, which is a moral concept, you need someone else coming in. You need someone else hindering you to prevent you from doing something. Okay? And one way in which this is sometimes put forward is that, you know, Republicans move from free choices to free choosers. They care about freedom as a property of the individual, not as a property of all the options out there. Okay? So people can be free, more or less, depending on whether someone else is controlling their actions, independent of how many things they can actually do with that freedom. So they're quite, quite separate categories. Yeah? Now, Republicans don't say that it's not important to have more options. They just think it's a category mistake to think of that as freedom. Okay? So, and here's a point with disability. You just couldn't immediately sort of link it into this. Because when I was sort of first mentioning to some people working in the field of disability studies, they said, well, but you know, when we think about people with disabilities, we really care about the options because, you know, we kind of want to broaden the options, the range of things they want to do, they can do. And to some extent, that's right. But, you know, one of the things we've learned from, say, the social model of disability is precisely how many of the things that people with a disability can't do is dependent on the fact that it's socially constructed and socially constrained. So you bring in the social model of disability already at this point, and you will realize that free choosers actually already captures a whole range of things that we can do. Okay? Right? And I'm sure you're all familiar with the sort of model of disability, so I don't have to explain this. A second point, so freedom is relational, it's about choosers, not choices. Second point, freedom is absence of alien control. And alien, this is not people in UFOs coming in, okay, this is, you know, other people controlling you in general. Right? So, so here is an interesting distinction, the liberals, the liberals in philosophy, traditionally also had a problem with alien control. They think that freedom is a problem of interference. It's people actually interfering that makes you unfree. If you want to leave the room and I keep the door closed, that's an actual interference. Okay? Now, Republicans basically say, 
I mean, that is a problem, but there actually is a further problem. Namely, some people are in a position of power to interfere, and even when they don't do this, but they can do at any moment, you have a problem. Okay? Think of, you know, one classic example is a sort of the, the very nice slaveholder. You know, so someone is a slave, but, you know, the master is a very, very nice, kind person, and he lets the slave pretty much do what they want. But that doesn't make the slave free, because the master at any point can change their mind. More than that, the master being this nice kind of person probably depends the extent to which the slave tries to be, <laughs> you know, tries to keep the friendship going and so on and so forth. So one of the biggest problems with this sort of issue is that, you know, there's a lot of occasions where people in power, you know, where if, if you have someone in power who can potentially interfere with your life, you always kind of want to make sure you want to keep them as a friend. You don't want to annoy them too much. So you're going to change your own life while already anticipating what's going on on the other side. And that's not freedom. This is what Republicans argue, you know. At this moment, the power relation in itself is compromising your freedom, even when there's no explicit interference, okay? And again, I think there's a very interesting parallel when you look at the disability literature, because, and this is something that I've, you know, back in my OT days definitely experienced, a lot of people with disabilities are very dependent on other people. And you know, and one of the huge problems there is precisely that, you know, there's all these sort of nifty little ways in which people can exercise power, right? So, and you know, and the more dependent you are on someone else, the more you kind of have to be very careful that you don't basically piss off the wrong people, right? Okay? And this is a crucial, crucial issue. And of course, the more it becomes more crucial the more you're really dependent on this for a wider range of activities in your life. Okay? But it seems to me that that sort of issue, issues to do with normalizing expectations, other people telling you the whole time what you should need and what your interests should be, what you should want, how you should behave yourself, and so on and so forth, this seems to fit very, very clearly with this Republican kind of issue. Okay? A third example, or a third criterion, <coughs> freedom is political. A lot of people, again, the liberals tend to think of freedom as sort of the space outside of politics. You know, it's like freedom from the state, freedom from state interference, okay? Uh, and this is where the Republicans south of the border play a big game. But the Republicans here are the total opposites. They actually think that freedom is political. Why? Because freedom, it's not just enough that we are aware of these relations of alien domination. What we need for freedom is that the person themselves, the free person, has to have control of their own life. And control requires policies and social institutions in many areas of life, okay? Which means state interference, but state interference controlled by the democratic polity and controlled by individuals themselves. So the Republican conception of freedom is very political. There is a lot of interference from the state, but it's a state which is properly, should be properly controlled by the democratic polity, and also have lots of mechanisms for individuals to control in case something goes wrong, for example, the courts and so on and so forth. Now, as you can imagine, this is a highly controversial point, lots of issues around this, but I hope you get the general gist of the picture. So, Republicans don't have a problem with state interference as such, provided the state doesn't run wild and becomes a dominator themselves. As long as the state can be controlled, it's an assistance in some sense, it's in support of this sort of freedom. Okay? And again, you can see a very clear link with disability in the sense that one of the core concerns for Republicans would precisely be to find as many possible mechanisms for people with a disability to control their own life. Whether this is participation in the high end of politics, really sort of top level government, or in one-on-one -on -one relationship with therapists of all sorts, okay? It doesn't matter what level. So this is political, but politics features in, politics is everywhere where we have differences of power, okay? So, three criteria. So here's a nice quote of Philip Pettit, which I think summarizes this nice. So, just to look at the bottom part, so freedom will provide a protective field that makes you resistant to the arbitrary incursions of others, 
It will ensure that you are in control of what you choose. That is the definition, the very gist of Republican freedom. Okay? So let's now see how this applies to disability. So, so here is an obvious kind of political argument. When I read disability rights literature and the disability movement literature, one thing that always pops out is this point about nothing about us without us. It's really about political exclusion. There's a lot of issues going wrong in society, but the starting point, the really fundamental one, seems to be some form of you know everyone else telling us what to do. And this, to me, is a fundamental kind of Republican intuition. So it seems that the Republican view here ties in, in a quite direct way, with what's going on in disability rights and disability movement. And you know, I, when I was working in Ireland, I, I was quite involved with some of the disability rights activists there, or I knew a lot of them, and I tested it out on them, and they, you know, they seem to agree. So, you know, as far as a philosopher does empirical research, that's what we do. So here's an argument, do you agree? Yes, okay, great. <laughs> That's like a, it's not very robust science, but you know, it's what we do. So, there's also an interesting, I think, philosophical argument, if you kind of think back of some of the things we were saying earlier. So we want to have a theory that grounds everyone at the same level, while also respecting differences, right? That was the big challenge. So it seems to me that freedom from domination is a core human interest. It's essential to human flourishing as a moral agent, okay? The moment someone else controls your life, you're not an agent anymore. Or, you know, or your agency is diminished to the extent that this control is exercised. And very, very interesting, this is a core interest that's shared by all, whether you're disabled or not. So it cuts through this distinction between, you know, being disabled or not, okay? It's of course true that different people will have different ways in which they want to lead their lives. But the, what, what's the same is the fact that they want to lead their life without outside interference in that fundamental sense. Okay, that's the core interests that shared. And it seems to me that, you know, some more work needs to be done, but it seems to me that Republican freedom has the two interesting components, namely it really affirms the equal worth and status of free citizens in a political sense. Everyone has that fundamental interest, that fundamental entitlement to being free. But at the same time, they can also appreciate a lot of the differences. So Republicans are very sensitive to the many, many different ways in which our society makes some people more vulnerable to domination. Think about, you know, women in an oppressed relationship inside the household, okay? Think about older people in society. Think about immigrants. You can name loads of things, and including disability. Now, all these groups are vulnerable to domination in many different ways and through different sort of mechanisms, but what they share underneath this is this fundamental equality. So it seems to me that this theory has the equality at the right side and also can appreciate the difference and the fact that in order to accommodate this difference, we may need to have special measures in place. But those special measures are not dependent on someone being of lesser value. They're just dependent on everyone having an equal interest in this fundamental freedom. Okay? So that's the miracle trick, the sort of, how do you say, the magic trick of Republican freedom. So it's like pulling the rabbit out of the hedge. So how am I doing for time? A little more than that. Uh, 15 minutes left. Oh, oh, then that can work. Great. Okay, um, so I, I'd, I'd like to sort of do a bit of an application thing here. So, so what I'd like to do is say how republicanism kind of fits in the social sphere through three rights. A right to social participation, a right to civic contribution, and a right to contestation. And then finally, I want to say something about republicanism in the clinical setting, specifically client-centered practice. Okay, so... Let's run through this. So, the right to social participation, of course, is a big one in this particular room. I mean, in general, we all like to talk about social participation and you know, many people outside. So, is there anything specific about republicanism here? Well, the one thing is, so republicanism very obviously aligns itself with the sort of general anti-discrimination agenda that you find in the disability rights movement when you go through this, right? And 
the argument here is Republicans basically argue that, well, you know, the, the problem of discrimination, you know, excluding people on the basis of discrimination, is that it does increase vulnerability for domination. Okay? So that's, that's the obvious link. That's the thing we really care about, so to speak, as Republicans. So here is actually a little interesting point. You will find in the literature people who will argue that if we do positive discrimination, that's also a problem. It's also a problem of discrimination because you know you're taking one group on the basis of criteria and you're doing something different than another group. Republicans basically say to this, utter nonsense. Okay? Why is it utter nonsense? Because negative discrimination makes you vulnerable to domination. Positive discrimination makes no one vulnerable to domination. So we have a very clear argument why we can accommodate certain things and other things don't work. Okay? So as you can imagine, this would mean quite a lot of arguments in favor of all sorts of accommodation, but not necessarily unrestrained accommodation. I mean, you know, we're still going to have debates about how far within the society we can accommodate um, people with a disability. One key point, of course, is that one re Republican core argument here is that, you know, people with a disability themselves have to be very much part of this debate, okay, in a very strong sense. So the only way in which we can figure out where, if any, there are reasonable boundaries on accommodation is by including everyone involved in this, the stakeholders, and, and especially the people who've traditionally been excluded from it. Okay? Another point I think is worthwhile mentioning is it's not just about broadening sort of options for participation, it's also about looking very, very carefully about how we do this, the very sort of specifics of policy design. So we want to make sure, for example, that dignity and security are always key features there. So you can imagine a policy that allows someone to participate, but still requires you to go through all these processes that, you know, where you kind of have to prove yourself and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a problem, right? I mean, social participation in this sense really has to keep in line with issues around dignity and security and so on and so forth. Very obviously, um, I think Republicans should be very wary about, you know, a whole host of quasi-institutionalization schemes that have been going on, sometimes deliberately, sometimes accidentally, you know, people are sort of slotted into quasi-institutionalized settings, sometimes by default, but, you know, this is very, very worrisome. Why? Because the moment you get into this space, yeah, you're vulnerable for domination, uh, right? And, and one interesting little debate, I think, and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of controversies around this one as well, but of course, direct payment schemes, for example, is, is one possible mechanism in which you might imagine giving people more control in a particular sort of area. To what extent this is effective or practical and so on and so forth, I'm, I'm very happy to throw open for discussion. I mean, I'm sure people here know more about this than me. But intuitively, at, the, at least, this seemed to fit within sort of a Republican scenario about social participation. Okay? And of course, there's a huge amount more to be said about this, right? but I'm, I'm sure lots more will come up uh, during the day. So, a right to civic contribution. This is kind of a controversial one. Okay? So here is, here is the argument. Often enough, contribution is looked at as a duty. It's looked at as, you know, unless you contribute, you can't get any rights, and so on and so forth. But you can actually look at it as a very different way. You can just think that people themselves are quite happy to contribute, be part of society in the fullest sense, provided they get the opportunities. And getting the opportunities means being able to sort of contribute on your own terms, not someone else telling you what counts as contribution or not. Okay? And there's at least two reasons why contribution is relevant. The first one is that, you know, partly what I said before, if you don't contribute, you're regarded as a second-class citizen. Right? So, this is a tricky thing. You may like it or not, but this is how a lot of our societies work at the moment. And the second thing is that actually prohibiting people to contribute really counts as a sort of an unjust intervention, right? I mean, what would be the justification for telling someone, first, you know, we don't value your contribution, and then secondly saying that, and because you don't contribute, you know, we're going to sort of ship you away in some second-rate part of society. We're going to sort of, you know, put you in a little thingy on the side. And that's effectively what goes on in a lot of countries today. And I think it's hugely problematic. I mean, personally, but also on Republican grounds. And so one, I think one of the really, really interesting debates is precisely about what 
should we count as proper contribution? And you know, one of the biggest issues, of course, is that today everything that's part of the formal labor market and its associated schemes that's counted as social contribution, and the rest is sort of, you know, is very much disvalued. And incidentally, this does not just apply to disability. I mean, there's a lot of other activities in society that are not valued properly. Care in general within the family is one of them. So one of the things that republicanism would say is, you know, in many ways we have here an agenda of shaping the general debate about what counts as contribution. And there's no reason why, you know, the sort of disability movement shouldn't link with the feminist movement and so on and so forth and push the same agenda, okay? And the moment we shift this around, this idea of what counts as social contribution, there's no reason why people with a disability, a whole, you know, and we're talking of course about a huge diverse group of people, why each of them shouldn't be seen as contributing in their own right, in some way, and actually should be granted the right to do this, should not be, you know, prevented from doing this in various sort of ways. Final point, uh, right to contestation. So this really follows from this whole argument in Republican theory that we need to control our state institutions. And one way we do this is through electoral democracy, but you know, that's like voting once every four years and then lots of weird stuff happens. And you know, and then we have to kind of wait another couple of years before we can either vote them in or vote them out. And you know, a lot of things can happen, right? So, the argument of contestation is that in between these electoral cycles, individuals and groups should really have the right to sort of, you know, it's almost like pull the alarm bell, so to speak. You know, to say that a particular government, democratically elected, is fine. But, you know, at this point they're instituting a policy which is problematic. You know, it violates my freedom, it potentially makes me vulnerable to domination. There should be a mechanism where I can tingle the bell and say, hold on, hold on. We need to review this. We need to carefully look at this. Okay? And these, you know, these sort of measures of contestation, so they, they have obviously instrumental value in guaranteeing more access, more control. They also have a very strong symbolic value because you know, granting every individual these powers is also what makes us citizens, right? So one of the biggest problems in, in a lot of democratic um, politics at the moment is that very obviously certain groups have more influence than other groups. So this is sort of a mechanism to start, you know, evening the scales out a bit. And so the key point basically would be to try and find as many mechanisms and as many instruments as we can to give disabled citizens control over disability policy through this sort of contestation. And so two very obvious ways, okay, Two very obvious ways. One is through consultation, making sure that as the policy agenda is being set from the very beginning, you know, disabled citizens are part of the consultation process, are actually being sort of, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Well, what I said, are part of the consultation process. I think that's, that's straightforward. A second point then though is, is appeal after the fact. So there has to be mechanisms where people say, look, all sort of decisions have been made. It could even be after implementation, but there genuinely is a problem. We need to be able to pull this alarm bell. Courts are one option, but courts are very controversial in many sort of ways. And again, this is something we can put open for discussion. But this, of course, is at the level of policy. But you can think about the same sort of mechanisms being applied in smaller settings, whether it's within particular care facilities, within, you know, your rehab settings, and so on and so forth. It's all about finding mechanisms to give this control. So the bottom line then is Republicans require disabled citizens to be given real access to contestatory resources, okay? Whether it's consultation and a bit. So that's a general sort of speak. Having this right of contestation really is a, a very core essential point within Republican kind of political theory. And it seems to me, it seems to fit very, very well with the sort of issues that we had from disability rights and disability movement. Okay? Again, nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Okay? A clinical, a little clinical section and then we're done. Okay? So this is actually with a, a friend slash colleague slash uh, lecturer at, uh, in occupational therapy in Ghent. 
And you know, I started talking to him about this republicanism, and he basically said that actually, you know, there's some interesting stuff going on. But we're just thinking about all this client-centered practice, and you know, I think there's some similarities here. So I basically stole two slides from him, more or less. I adapted them with his permission. Actually, it doesn't count as permission if you don't ask for advance. I asked, I emailed him after, but it's okay. It's okay. So, and it has proper attribution. Very important. So, so here is basically client-centered practice, which I'm sure you all are a lot more familiar with. But in a nutshell, I mean, the argument basically is this, you know, how, how do you set up your sort of therapeutic standards and benchmarks and so on and so forth? One way to do this is sort of, you know, evidence-based and effectiveness analysis and so on and so forth. Everything objective. Another way to do this is involve the clients at the core inside of it. And the whole idea about client-centered practice, of course, is this idea of having a partnership between therapist and client giving the client's goals more priority and so on and so forth, adopting a more sort of listening position, taking the particular views seriously, and all these sort of things. So client actively participates in negotiating the goals and this is supposed to be an empowering feature. Okay? So, so far this all looks great and fit, seems to fit very, very well in the sort of Republican agenda of, you know, giving people more control and contestation. So, I have one more slide. So, so here is something you should know. Philosophers really are troublemakers. So, I'm going to end with a, a slide which introduces a complication and then I'm going to stop and let you think about it and resolve. You can then resolve it all and tell me and I'll, I'll adapt for the next session. So. so, here is the complication. And I don't know whether this is a problem here, but it seems to be a problem in Belgium where this particular debate originated. So, Clearly, if you have client-centered practice, there could be a tension between what a therapist has in terms of, you know, what they think is the most appropriate therapy and what a client wants. And, you know, and you can still think, well, with this negotiation thing, we can try and come to some sort of agreement. But here is then the biggest problem, which is when we talk about clinical performance measures at a higher level up, whether it's in an institution, whether it's regulated, at whatever level is your, you know, your, your regulations are being done, often there the measures are supposed to be these objective ones. It's all about quality of life measures and participation measures that's so on and so forth. So then, you know, in some sense, you know, as a therapist, taking the client too seriously is going to run you into trouble higher up, so to speak. Okay? So how, how do we negotiate that dilemma? So the point basically is, is it's one thing as a therapist to be aware of these sort of Republican issues and to try and accommodate those, but it has to filter through the system, so to speak. And we might have a problem there, given that the way the system is formulated at the moment seems to go against this. So the question then is whether we can use this Republican perspective to, to sort of help us keep focus. I mean, you know, can we keep the sort of continuous dynamic dialogue going and keep this contestation going while at the same time trying to reform the system and so on and so forth? And this goes way too beyond my area of expertise, so I really just want to throw that out, a little negative note to end the session. But, uh, but more, I mean, not a negative note, more like an invitation of, you know, for you to think about this, and perhaps we can pick this even up in the round table, and so on and so forth. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. I was wondering how uh, the Republican freedom argument could help, or maybe it would be hard to justify it with your last slide about patient advocacy from the professional, because there's still a power relationship that is different, as you yes. mentioned. And when you want to advocate for the patient, you're also in that power position. But how could it? Go, yeah. go so, so, so I think I think that that's a very, very good question. So, so, so I I am all in favor of therapists wanting to do as much as possible for their clients, including as much as possible to empower their clients. But you have to know your limits. You are effectively a therapist, and the other person is a client. And there's I think there's generally a structural limit is what you can do. So I think in many ways we also should advocate for having third-party advocates who, if necessary, can take this up. 
And I think we shouldn't, you know, it's sometimes regarded as a sort of an affront or an issue of distrust or, or you know, we've not done our work well if a third party intervenes. No, we, I mean, we've done our work very well if we can actually advocate for a structure like that. And we should look at this as part of our general process. So, so, so you know, so a twofold answer. I think it's very good to advocate as much as possible, but I think precisely, you know, we should do what we do well, which is we should do our therapy, but we should keep in mind that when it comes to the full empowerment, something else is needed. There's a structural barrier, and that means the client themselves have to be kept in control. And there's a limit to what we can do, I think. Yes, my question is about uh, the client that practice and its uh, relationship with consciousness and that with consciousness with, with, yes and the point okay. is when yeah. you're working with a uh, brain injury uh, you have uh, patients with cognitive impairment who are not necessarily aware of what is going on no. so uh, how can you conciliate their needs and their expectations uh, in this uh, yeah. framework of client centered practice and uh, what we do as clinicians Again, a, a very, very good question, and, and I actually have in mind at some point, because it's, it's not just in the clinical context. I mean, cognitive disabilities is a huge problem for a theory of justice and disability in society in broader sense, right? So this is, this is a very, very particular tricky, tricky group. So, and I'm actually, I'd be very interested at some point, I need to think about this properly and, and think about this in terms of the separate paper. So I don't, I haven't thought about it apart from realizing it's a huge problem. I think part of the answer, in some sense, goes along the similar lines. I think, and, and in some countries this is being done, we need separate advocates, you know? So even, I, I think part of the problem is, of course the client themselves, with limited consciousness, there's a limit to what we can do, right? But the problem is, as a therapist, that we, we really look at these people from a very particular framework. So sometimes you just need a third party, basically, even someone who in many ways possibly doesn't have that sort of training and basically says, look, I'm looking at this now, I'm looking at your arguments, and then I'm going to check and see what the client wants in as much as it's possible and try and discover and then make some sort of decisions. And in, you know, this, for example, this is sometimes what's happening, I mean, to, to use a different example, this is sometimes what's happening in family courts, right? When we're talking about juveniles and so on and so forth. So, you know, judges sometimes will take on that role and say, look, they're trying to, they don't claim to have an expertise about family dynamics and so on and so forth. They're just having, precisely because they have an outside perspective, they will, in some sense, try to listen as much as possible and so but I don't know how far that goes, it, especially in the clinical settings. But in your opinion, who would be the best third party? I have no idea. And, and here, is, here, here, is, here is my problem. I mean, the obvious answer would be some family member, but uh, exactly, <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've had enough experience and also, I mean, some of my other work, I, I do some work about organ donation and especially related to family members and there we see huge problems. So, so I. I mean, I'm afraid I can only tell you that you're absolutely right, this is a huge issue and it requires a lot of thinking, but I have no, I have no clear sort of um, policy proposal in this respect, so sorry. But it's, it's a very good point. Sure. Um, I have a question. Um, you said that one of the tenants or whatever of Republican freedom was this thing where you said where you are in a position to robustly resist alien control of your life. I'm just wondering, people that we serve, disabled people, how often can we think they are actually in a position to robustly resist control of their lives because they are generally in a very vulnerable position where they need help and they need other people there supporting them. And so I'm just, it's like this question of freedom seems sure. a bit counter yeah. to the, what they're going through. So, I don't know. No, 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 exactly. And I mean, and of course, the point precisely is that the way things are at the moment from a freedom perspective, it's hugely problematic. So what, you know, in, in a sense, what this theory is supposed to give you is a direction in which to think about improving things, you know. And, and one of the things I, I hope that becomes clear, I mean, it's not, in, in some sense, 
this is a lot of this work has been done by disability rights activists, disability rights movement, not necessarily without a fully kind of grounded theory underlying it. And then you have the philosophers and theories of justice who totally ignore disability. In many ways, what I claim is actually, you know, there might be a theory out there that can link these two together. I think republicanism in many ways can give us the sort of justification that some people think is needed for a lot of intuitions and a lot of arguments that are already out there in the field. Okay? So, just one more point. I mean, it's, it's also, you know, it's not like we need to reach a particular level and say now is the person free and if it's below that we don't really care, right? So every little step, even baby steps, is a move in the right direction. So, and I think one of the things that we can do with this is, is try and indicate at least in which direction we should be moving and give good reasons of why we should really push this or add reasons to whatever reasons we already have. So, not sure that's a full answer to your question, or even a partial answer. <laughs> this one okay. Just a there. Sure. It's okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. We have time for one last question. Okay, I can do it a break. Can <laughs> I just make one point? Sure. Um, a wonderful disability rights activist in the United States named C.B. Linton has taken the nothing without us to, about us, nothing about us without us phrase and changed it to nothing without us. Okay. If you think about that, that's actually a huge transformation. It's true. Because it means other people are no longer defining. We're at the table all the time. So I think I think that's, that's really good. cool, and it would be really great to try to introduce that kind if of crazy. If you could send me that reference, I'd be I'd, yeah. I'd love to look at that. I'm, yeah. I'm not familiar with that yeah. particular yeah. work, so that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.